Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Welcome back to another episode of the Work From Home Show. I'm your host, Naresh Fissa, with... Adam Schrader on this lovely day. Absolutely. It's a lovely day. The, the lockdowns are over. We can leave our house, get some fresh <laughs> air. We don't have to work from home all the time. It's a... Uh, it's uh, I don't know. I kind of, I'm kind of missing the old, the, the the good old days of being locked down. Adam, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my kids have been riding their bikes all over this neighborhood lately, and it's kind of crazy. You've seen so many more people like walking outside and riding their bikes, and you know, doing all sorts of things. So it's been been interesting. It's be interesting to see if that health kick keeps up. Yeah. Well, I want to talk today about pricing Adam and by pricing I mean we've got a lot of listeners who work from home many of them are business owners they sell products or services and they've actually written into us asking how much do I sell my product for how much do I sell my service for and I think that's a very important discussion that we need to have because I was wondering the same thing when I was in their shoes four years ago, five years ago, and I made some major mistakes when it came to pricing that hurt my business tremendously. Let me guess, and you undervalued yourself significantly? No. No, you overvalued it was the opposite. Yourself. It was the opposite. I overvalued myself. So let's talk, let's talk about that. Let's talk about kind of what happened with me, what I learned from it, how I price now, and what our listeners can take away from it. So when I started my company, Christian Media and Marketing, I went from the corporate world to working at my house. And so I had this kind of corporate mentality and having a corporate mentality means you have a corporate pricing strategy, right? So Adam, if you wanted to hire, let's say IBM to do IT work for you Mm -hmm. versus your friend down the street who you know, works at some small company or maybe he's like an independent IT guy, who do you think is going to be cheaper? Well, theoretically, you would expect the, the smaller company to bid lower for your business. Exactly, exactly. Uh, because IBM is IBM, right? The reason why they charge so much is because of the brand. They've been around for what, like 50 years? Long time. Um, they've been around a while. <laughs> they've been around a while. They're one of the largest IT companies in the world and they hire some very top-notch talent. I have friends who who got hired right out of school at IBM. Very prestigious place to work, good place to start a career, good place to work for really your entire life. Uh, The salary is incredibly competitive, and they have all this overhead. So as a result, you would expect them to charge a lot more simply because of all those expenses that they have, right? They're the big corporation. So I had this corporate mentality because I worked, I didn't work at a huge corporation like IBM, but I worked at a fairly large company that did very well. And so when I went out on my own, I took that pricing strategy and implemented it into Krish Media and Marketing. And guess what? I actually did well for the first year, utilizing, or really for the first, I'd say 15 months, almost the first two years, I did well just charging insane amounts of money to to clients and um, you know doing my usual work that, that I do for Chris Media Marketing. Well, I ran into a problem after about 15, 16 months. And that problem was contracts weren't getting renewed. And contracts weren't getting renewed not because of the quality of the work or the quantity of the work, but because of the amount that I was charging for those services. And 
it it's kind of strange because you can have amazing quality work. You can be a good worker and provide excellent work and excellent product, excellent quality. But if you price yourself out uh, or if you price yourself so high, then the quality of that work is essentially diminished, right? So I'll give you an example. If I want to, to have a website created, okay? So Adam, you're a web designer. So let's just say your standard, I mean, really like your standard pricing is anywhere between uh, like 400 to $500. Would you say like your average for website? A, for a really simple one, yeah. Yeah. So, so you can create a website for a client and charge 400 or $500, right? And good chance you, you do the work and they're very happy with the site. Okay, excellent. Well, if all of a sudden you say, hey, I'm gonna charge you for this website, and now, I'm gonna, now it, the price is gonna be 4,000 or $5,000, or let's even up it more to what, to what uh, one of Some our- Some of the ridiculous guests, companies charge? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> one of our guests, James Altucher, was charging 40,000 to 50,000 dollars for websites back in the late 90s, early 2000s. So let's say you up it to, you know, 40,000, 50,000 dollars. Same website, now you're charging 40,000 or 50,000 dollars. Now all of a sudden, the client, what? It's human psychology. All of a sudden, the client now feels like the quality isn't as good. Even though it's the same website and they said before, hey, this is amazing quality. Now all of a sudden the quality is not good because they feel like, holy smokes, I'm paying a lot of money and this is all I'm getting. Or just in general, nothing is ever enough. When you charge that much amount of money, nothing, no work is enough for the client. And so if times get tough, guess who's gonna get cut? The contractor. Contract's gonna get cut, it's not gonna get renewed. And so uh, I was in extremely misled when I got started in my business because I had older people consulting with me. And, and look, I was like young. I didn't really know anyone. I, I didn't know like podcasts weren't a thing. I, I, I didn't really read a lot. I just, whoever told me any unsol unsolicited advice, I took it to heart. And I got some terrible advice, which was, <laughs> hey, you need to, you need to, charge a lot, as much money as you can. You need to get everything that you can out of the client because if you underprice yourself, they're not going to take you seriously. Yeah. And I've got a story about that too, about where I lost a client because I underpriced myself. But but they told me this, so I was like, okay, corporate mentality, I'm going to charge all this money. And well, let's just work. say in fairness, if you provide the quality of a corporate environment, you should get paid the same. But just the way that our minds are made up, you're not going to get paid the same. Yes. So I'll, I'll make the case, uh, Krish Media Marketing, we're, we're an online business. We're not a corporation. We don't have offices. We don't have full-time employees. Uh, so yeah, we're, we don't have that brand. But the quality of our work, and I, and I know this because we've worked with clients who hired both of us. They would hire Krish Media Marketing and they would hire another like corporate agency to do the same work because they wanted to test to see, okay, should I stay with like the expensive corporation or should I give like the little guys a chance? And it turned out that our customer service, our business development, our, our design work, our, you know, everything was way better than the corporation. And we were charging one tenth the cost. I'm not even making that number up one tenth the cost. And so then people might ask, well, one tenth the cost, like why not, you know, half the cost or why not, you know, uh, just an amount slightly lower than, than the competition? Well, there are other companies like mine out there which do the same thing and they're charging little as well. So I'm competing against them. And so what I do, how I, I learned my lesson because I actually got into a lawsuit with a client because they felt like um, they felt like the amount of money on the contract that was owed to us was not 
uh, comparable or was not proportionate to the work that we were delivering and the quality of the work that we were delivering. And once you get into the work that you're delivering or the quality of the work that you're delivering, that becomes, uh, it becomes a very, it's not black or white, it becomes very hazy because then you start asking, okay, what is work? Like literally we were in this lawsuit and our attorneys were arguing about, okay, what is work? Is, is it the finished product or the process getting there? Yeah. Is it a finished product? Is it the process? Is it, I had to move out to California and, you know, find a place to live in California and get a car and do all sorts of stuff. Is that all part of work? Um, but then the quality of the work, the lawyers were arguing about the quality of the work. So, you know, my lawyer was like, look at this amazing quality of work. This is incredible. And then the other lawyer is like, oh, this is really crappy. So then they had to, you know, basically figure out, well, how do we assess the quality of work? Like, how do we know? Like, there's no way to test it or, or you know, there, there's no system, right? And so they actually, lawyers just kind of gave up and, and said, you know, we got to settle this somehow because this is just silly. But you get the point of, the client can think whatever you can, you can create the Mona Lisa and the client's going to can come back and say, this is an ugly piece of shit. Like I'm not paying you hundred percent of the price. Her smile's uh, not good enough. Exactly. <laughs> There's just, and, and by the way, I, I think people, there are countless artists who did come out with works of art that were completely rejected by, uh, you know, I, I don't know who the, the museums, the the art business people, they were rejected because they said, oh, this is really, really ugly. And Leonardo da Vinci, he had so many failures uh, bleeding up to the Mona Lisa. I mean, he was told many times that the, you're a terrible artist. You're, you know, terrible at drawing, terrible at painting. So, again, it's very subjective, which makes it even hazier. There, again, there's no black, black or white. So in my case, that was my lesson. I learned, you know what? I need to change my pricing strategy because that advice I got about just charging as much as possible and basically draining the client, and it, it was not sustainable because my clients were not renewing contracts simply because of the cost. So I changed my business model for Krish Media Marketing. And I said, you know what? It's not about making a quick buck. I know my, my quality is good. But I need to have long-term sustainable clients so that they feel like they know exactly what they're getting for what they pay for. And on top of that, um, we, we offer you know, just a very affordable option so they can't switch to, to someone else. And so I changed that model. I looked at my margins. I looked at my overhead. And I basically took those numbers and charged according to whatever those numbers were. I charged obviously a little bit more than that and tried to keep my prices low. And that's why, that's why I can charge one tenth the cost of what these big corporations can charge. And the client, they feel great. They're like, oh wow, amazing work. I've paid one tenth and the money, it's like they become rep uh, repeat customers and we haven't had a single client leave since then. Not a single one has has said like, oh, you know, your work was crap. I'm I'm gonna leave, or oh, you ripped me off because I paid you all this money. I'm gonna go somewhere else. We haven't had a single one. Hundred percent rate of retention. Yeah. So the way I was told whenever I left uh, and started doing freelance work was my boss told me, you know, whenever you go out there, because I was moving cities, so he didn't care in terms of, you know, pricing and competing against them. He was like, take your, you know, however many weeks of vacation you want to get. So let's say you're taking two weeks. And so you're needing to make, uh, so you have 50 weeks that you're going to work. Just pretend you're working a 40 hour week. So that's 2000 hours a year and divide that into whatever salary you feel you need to make. So if you're wanting to make $40,000 then you need to charge $20 an hour. So realistically, the way I price myself sometimes now, I don't do this all the time. At this point, some of the things I just know I'm going to charge this much. I can get it. I provide good value for it. But let's say you want to make $60,000 and you know you want to take five weeks of vacation, but you only want to work 20 hours a week. 
So you have 47 weeks that you're going to work out of the year. You know you're going to work 20 hours a week, so you know you have, what is that, 940 hours? Well, then just divide $60,000 by that 940, and that's how much you need to charge to live. So now you need to be sure that the quality that you're going to give them is equal to that $65 an hour or whatever that you're going to have to charge. And if you can't charge that amount, if it's not, if what you're giving isn't worth that, then you need, need to either adjust the salary that you're going to take or the hours that you're going to give them in order for it to happen. That's what I was always taught. So now that's as an employee, not a business owner. Yeah. So what you just said is, uh, is a, a a derivative of of what I initially said. Yeah. So what I initially said was very vague. It was charge as much as you can. Now what you just said, um, I do not agree with at all. Because really? what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up uh, short selling yourself. Because what you're doing now is you're not taking the free market into consideration. You're taking your own personal situation into consideration. So you're setting your own personal goal of this is how much money I need. This is how much money I want to make. Well, the competition that's in, you know, India or that freelancer who, who, you know, 25 year old freelancer, they don't have all those requirements, which the older generation has. And this is a major, major reason why so many of the older folk, like the baby boomers have lost their jobs over the past six, seven years because they had this mindset of thinking so robotically, you know, this is how much money I need for retirement. This is how much money my, I, I, I pay in mortgage. This is how much I'm gonna need for, you know, vacation with my wife. And then they make their calculations based on that. Well, that's why I said you had to make sure that what you're offering is worth that. So, you know, if you need, if you feel like you need $70 an hour to do what you need to do, is the work that you're providing worth that $70 an hour? Well, so we, we can we can take an example. Let's say you're a let's say you're a um, a cleaning lady, right? And you clean houses. So if if you're a cleaning lady and you clean houses and you've got a family of four, you've got um, or let's just say you're a single mom, you've got two kids, and uh, you need X amount of dollars in order to pay your rent, pay for your kids, you know, clothes, supplies, food, and all that stuff. Well, the fact of the matter is this is just an example um, but the fact of the matter is it's very likely that the amount that you're going to need to live that type of lifestyle the free market is not going to accept the rates that you're going to want uh, they're not going to accept those rates because your competition probably going to be charging a lot less so you're going to have to adjust accordingly um, or you're going to have to find something else to do if you want to meet those goals. That's just that's just the heart of the matter. Well, that's just saying what I was saying is, you know, you could need $30 an hour in that situation, but you have to ask is the value that you're adding it worth $30 an hour. And if it's only worth 20, then you need to work one and a half times the hours that you were thinking you were going to work. So you're going to have to pick up more jobs. You're going to have to, you know, convince your client that they need more hours than they think they need. I mean, you just have to adjust that way. Well, that's con uh, convincing a client to to give more hours or, or to pay more. That's a, that's a difficult thing. But, well, I know, but, but if, if you, think... you say, hey, you know, I'm doing this for you 10 hours, but, you know, if you do another five hours, I think we can accomplish this. And then, you know, convincing them that, hey, there's other projects that you can do. I mean, it's a possibility. Well, so I, I wanted to give another example on the other side, and, and then we'll talk about hours. So on the other side, there's when you short sell yourself. So uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we offer a service. We offer an online reputation management service, and it's, it's results-based, but we also do charge retainer on, on doing the work. And it's very expensive to, to do this type of work, very expensive because it requires a lot of manual labor. Now, with that being said, if I went by, if I charged according to, you know, this is how much money I need to survive, this is how much money, you know, I, I need to pay rent, and I ran all these calculations and I charged, 
uh, I'd probably be making one tenth of what I'm currently making. And so what I'm saying here is the market for online reputation management is the, the, the amount of money you can make is much higher. So even though I'm not working really much at all, I'm making a lot more. I'll make more money in one online reputation management deal in one month than in probably how in, in one month how much I'd make uh, consulting and working on, or not one month, uh, seven months consulting and working on podcasts. So um, what, what I'm saying here is I could easily short short change myself and say, oh, this is how many hours I'm working and this is how much it's mm-hmm. going to be. But uh, there, there are really two factors. Number one, you have to look at your overhead and your margins, and you obviously need to be making money off of every project, off of every deal. That's number one. It, if, if it costs you $5 to make a sandwich, you got to sell the, the sandwich for at least $6 so you can make a profit, not for $4. So that's, you know, that's a great example. You got a product, it costs $5. Do you want to be the guy who's selling it for $10? Or do you want to be the guy who's selling it for $100? And so where I got into trouble was I was that guy selling it for $100. And people were like, they felt like they were getting ripped off. And when I lowered that price to $10, all of a sudden, same work, same quality, contracts renewed, everyone's happy. So, so I found that happy medium. So how do you how do you find the market for your pricing? How can people find that? Well, like I said, they have to they have to number one know what their margins are. So I, I gave the example. Right, but I'm the, talking about like whenever you're looking then, for online reputation management. How did you find the the market rate for that? Yeah. So all you have to do is just go on the internet and call call competitors, call people who do the same thing. A lot of them already have pricing on their websites. So you can go on their websites, look it up, or go on Elance or Fiverr, one of these sites, look up how much they're charging. It's it's that simple. And in my case, because, and really in your case, if you work in like IT services, technology services, information services, that's a, a digital industry, or those are digital industries. And so your competition here in the United States, your competition you don't even need to pay attention to because you automatically know, at least in Chris Media and Marketing's case, I know because I have people overseas that I outsource to, I know that my pricing is gonna blow the people here in the United States out of the water. I already know it. I know no matter, if I know my margin and I take that $10 approach instead of the $100 approach, I still know that I'm blowing the competition out of the water. I'm way cheaper than my competition. If I were to up my price to $15, I still know I'm beating my competition. But you know, maybe once I start getting the $20, $25, I could be approaching them and then I'm kind of losing that luster. So because of my model of, of outsourcing, you know, I have people work for me and I pay them. So because I, I because of that model, I know that my prices are very very competitive and when clients come back they co- they come back all the time and they say oh you want to charge a hundred dollars for this like can you do it for 80 i know i have the wiggle room because for that five dollar sandwich if i'm selling it for twenty dollars and they come back and they say can you do it for 15 uh you know let me let me check with my designer oh yeah che- i just checked with them yeah we can do it for 15 and i'm still making a great margin and i'm still beating my competition so what that does, basically what, what I'm saying is you, you can't have that, that nickel and dime approach of, you know, I, I need to make a dollar here, a dollar there because I'm working this many hours and I need to go on this vacation. You need to take a more holistic approach of knowing that you're making a profit and you've got a client for life. And that's just going to multiply. This is kind of like a holistic, like spiritual side of business where this is the way it's done. And if the client comes back and says, oh, you know, I can't afford that, can you lower it? Well, you've got the, you've got the leeway. And that's why we've, we rarely, like I don't think we've ever been turned down because our prices are too high. It just doesn't happen. And this is largely because we're doing business here in the United States. Now, if I was doing business in India, like if, I, if my clients were like in India or if they were in like Eastern Europe or like Africa, 
none of this applies because the rules change completely, the business model changes completely, lifestyle changes completely. I, I can't speak to our, our, our listeners overseas, but if you're in, uh, if, if your clients are like US based, UK based, Canada based, you're working with some you know legitimate clients who have cash on hand, then you absolutely want to, um, at least my philosophy, you absolutely want to charge as little as possible while still making a lot of money. Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> Uh, sounds good. So, the what I was saying about undercharge, I actually uh, a client came to us because they they needed help with Facebook PPC and um, just AdWord, like Google AdWords, social media, and they came to us. And so, I did my research on the client. They didn't seem like a like a corporation or anything. And so I priced accordingly. I, I did. I looked at my margins, and I priced according to the margins. And I, I sent them the quote. And this guy came back and he said, "This is way too cheap. I'm like, like, why do you charge so little?" And and I actually thought I was charging quite a bit for the service because I charged other people even less than what I quoted them. And I, I told him, I said. Basically, when we get a new client, this is always our philosophy. We want to get you through the door. So we're not trying to, you know, take your money, scam you. We want to, like, this is basically like a promotional price. And that way we build rapport with you. You get to see how we work. There's little risk to you. So you just give us a chance. And this is how I've gotten new clients. I've literally told them, if my margin, going back to the sandwich example, if if I need to charge six dollars to generate a profit for that first client i'll i'll be at like ten dollars and i'll say this is how this is how much we'll charge because you're a new client i'm not as worried about making you know that 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 profit because i want to keep this client for life and so i told this this client this potential lead that and he just came back and said he said yeah i get it i've had a lot of people reach out to me agencies and you know other competitors and you're just priced too low. Um, I'm always skeptical of companies and people who price so low. And that was the end of the conversation. So that only happened once to me, <laughs> where somebody said, your prices are so, they're way too cheap. Like, I don't trust you. Like, I don't even want to do a test run with you. I don't even want to give you a chance because the price is so low. It was strange. Like I said, it's never happened before. It only happened that one time. But that was an example where um, looking back at it, I don't have any regrets. I actually think it had more to do with the client and him coming from that startup world. See, the startup world, these these startup guys, they raise a ton of money and they have to spend it. They, they're given a time limit to spend all the money. I mean, imagine that. Like, Can you imagine, Adam, where somebody just gives you like a million dollars and says, hey, you have to spend this money right now. You're not allowed to put it in the bank. You're not allowed to invest in real estate. You have to actually go to the store, like go on Amazon and just buy as much shit as possible. Yeah, it's like that's, Brewster's millions. That's the startup world. For, that's the VC world for you. And this guy came from the VC world where he, he's he's been involved with so many startups and he gets all his money and hires these large, expensive corporations because he's got to spend the money. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, you've got the little Chris Media marketing coming along, just trying to get a little, trying to get a client, charging, like trying to do the guy a favor, saying, "Yeah, we'll do, we'll do all this for this cheap price." And he says, "Oh, you're too cheap. I've got, I've got like a budget of." fifty thousand dollars that i need to spend i'm gonna go with ogilvy that's how much they're charging i'm just gonna go with them because they're charging a lot of money and i need to spend it <laughs> that's a lesson i learned there yeah i would also tell people in terms of people who are looking to sell their wares to be careful like i've turned down um contracts from you because i know that it's not going to be that i'm not even going to be in the right ballpark because they'll say hey, I want you to do this. And it's something that I kind of know how to do, 
but I'm going to have to train myself to do it. And you have to factor that into your pricing whenever you do it as an employee. You know, if you're going there trying to pick up jobs, because, you know, I know that this job you want me to take is going to take 10 hours, but I'm going to have to do five hours of education before I can even do those 10 hours. And at $15, you know, at 15 hours, it's not worth it to me um, if I charge what I would usually charge. And it's not worth it to the client to pay for those extra five hours. So just know, don't underprice yourself as a, you know, employee either. Yeah. And the other, the other area I want to talk about is the, the concept of hours. See, this is, I, I recommended that people take a, a holistic approach to business and to pricing and to not get caught up in the, you know, this is how much I charge per hour and this yeah. is how much I need to make. Well, you and I are and, coming at this from different vantage points. You're coming at it from more of a business owner overall overarching thing. I'm coming at it from more of a freelance project-based uh, employee because that's I tend to act more as an employee than a business owner. No, but it's kind of similar because because as a freelancer, you're independent and you you dictate the pricing. Right. So they, they ask you, how much do you charge? And you may not have someone on staff to do work for you, but even if you're a designer doing design stuff on your own, the principle still applies. Okay, it's going to, you know, my competition is is charging this much, or maybe you have to pay for like a WordPress, you know, premium theme or something. And so you have to take, you know, all that into account. And also we're talking time. So, so yeah. like when it, when it comes to me, for example, in time, I know that um, I can actually charge less uh, of my own time if I have to do something personally. So I can charge less because there's no overhead. And on right. top of that, it's just my time. So if I want to get someone in through the door on, on a first project, okay, I'm basically, if I need to donate, you know, an hour or two, that's okay with me. If that means getting a 10 year contract or a five year contract or a three year contract, I don't mind that at all. I will gladly put in five extra hours at no pay uh, if, if that means making you happy and keeping you around for three years, four years, five years. Yeah. I mean, it depends if this is just a one-off thing or not. That definitely, you know, but if someone's asking you like, hey, I want you to do this graphic for me and they just know that they're going to need, it's just a one-time thing, then, you know, you have to look at it in that regard, I personally think. Yeah, and, and the other thing is with with the hours, okay, just remember with the hours, I, I think hours, this is another area where I was very misled because, again, these mentors or people who are telling me things, they ran these calculations according to the hours, like you said. You know, if you work 2,000 hours a year and you run all these calculations, um, and what I quickly realized, you know, part of the reason why all these people who were advising me uh, got laid off or hasn't had a job in, you know, three years plus is largely because that's like a very corporate, uh, like eighties, nineties mentality where the, the billable rate was, was a huge deal. Well, we, we live in a time now where the, the concept of a billable rate from these consulting companies, from lawyers, it's, it's really almost, almost gone because of technology. And so the, the whole billable hour concept is, to me, it's complete, I've gotten ripped off by it, it's complete nonsense um, when, when people are like, oh, this is my rate and this is how much I charge per hour because it's not about how long they work. And I've been on the other side where I've billed people uh, by the hour and I'll inflate the, the numbers and say, oh yeah, it, this took ten hours to do, and they'll pay me for it. You know, it might have yeah. taken me three hours. I don't even remember the last time I did something hourly. Yeah, so you know, it might have taken me like three hours, but I'll bill it for ten hours, and they believe it because that's how long it took the last guy who was not very good to do it. So the the, the concept of of the billable hour to me, it's not very productive. That's why we charge on a project basis. So even if a project takes two hours of our time, that doesn't mean we're charging, you know, $50 an hour. 
we've done two hour projects where we charge a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, because you're not paying for the hour. If, if, the if you're paying, exactly, you're paying for the experience and the expertise. So if you're if you're paying for someone's time, literally just pick someone. There are a lot of unemployed people right now. Just pick someone off the street and pay them the nine dollars an hour, right? Just go ahead and do that. But the guy off the street, he's not going to be able to, you know, fix your WordPress errors. He's not going to be able to distribute your podcast to all the different podcast providers and aggregators and syndicators. He's not going to be able to, uh, you know, design a, a book cover and, and a spine and a back cover. He's not going to be able to do that. So it's just very important. And, and I hear all the time from this older generation, hourly billing and that concept is just completely gone. Those business models have changed because now it's all about the work that you do, what you can deliver, the results. That's what it's all about. Yeah, otherwise you're just paying for somebody's education. Yeah. If you hire somebody hourly, you're just paying for them to learn to do things that they're going to go out and sell to other people. Don't That's, be that guy. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I see so many people make that mistake. And so... Really, the, the overall, we've talked a lot, we've talked, you know, a lot of different concepts, principles here. And so, um, you know, in, in your freelance, let's go back to your freelance case, right? So you said your freelance case is heavily based on, like, the, the, the amount of hours that it's going to take to put in, right? And well, that's, that's how, how you I, I mean, I look at, for each different thing, I look at what the rate is in the industry and how many hours I think I can do it in. And then I multiply those together and I see, is that something I want to spend my time doing? Right. So that's, that is a very good way to, um, I think that's a very good way to price yourself because you're at least looking at like how much your competitors are charging. And that's, to me, that's like, they're, they're two key. You don't have the overhead. So the, the real key is, okay, what's everyone else charging and can I charge less? And you have control over that because you don't have the employees. You don't have the overhead. So if, you're, if your competitors are charging, you know, Y amount of dollars, well, you can charge Y minus 100. And yeah. boom, now that makes you absolutely more competitive. Yeah, and you have to remember that as a freelancer, you're going to have like eight different hourly rates. I mean, you know, I've got an hourly rate in my head for web design. I've got an hourly rate in my head for audio editing. You know, if I have to do any graphics work, I have an hourly rate for that in my head. I mean, you're not just always going to be a $75 an hour freelancer. You know, sometimes you're a $200 an hour. Sometimes you're $15 an hour. It's, you know, you're not just getting your $100,000 W-2 from your job for whatever you're doing. You're going to be all over the place. Yep. Completely agree. Completely agree. Um, so any other final thoughts? Adam, on pricing or pricing strategy? Well, I guess the only thing I would say is, you know, if you get told, hey, you're price your, pricing yourself too low, don't be afraid to up your price. <laughs> you know, don't, yeah. be, don't be afraid to do it. If you're worth it, you know, you might think it's ridiculous, but if that's what the market says you're worth, then that's what the market says you're worth. Yep, absolutely. Completely agree. One last thing, Adam, that I want to talk about is deflation. So deflation is the idea that the price of goods or services is going down. Now, I don't think the price of goods are going down, but I do think the price of services are going down. It was a rush because, to the bottom. Yeah, because of the internet, um, because of technology. And we're seeing that, with, or we're hearing about it because of the autonomous vehicles. That's going to cause deflation within the trucking industry. Where we've, I've seen it personally with technology. We talked about earlier how we interviewed a guest who was charging forty to fifty thousand dollars for a simple WordPress website way back in the late '90s and the early 2000s. And now there's technology where you can do it yourself for free, not for free, but for like twenty dollars. Or you can hire someone like you, Adam, to do it for you know four hundred, five hundred dollars. Now, there are still $40,000 websites out there, but they're hardcore websites. Well, those are, yeah, they're they're like uh, more software-related sites. They're more dynamic sites. Um, Big old e-commerce stores. 
Well, like when Facebook was first created in 2004, whenever that was, that's probably a $40,000 site to create something so interactive with so many widgets and so much development on the back end, at least $40,000 site. But the point I'm making here is that deflation is something we've seen throughout history and technology is the greatest deflationary invention ever. Mm -hmm. And so as we move forward, technology is only going to continue to improve, continue to improve. And um, what does that mean for you as a business owner or as a freelancer at home? That means technology has made your competition global. So your competition isn't just here in the United States. Your competition is now those tech workers in India and in Bangladesh and Pakistan and Eastern Europe and Philippines and Russia and China, they're your competitors too. And think about their cost of living, standard of living. Think about your cost of living, standard of living. It's going to change the way that you're going to have to price because the guy in India is going to be able to charge six, seven dollars an hour. Whereas the IT guy here in the United States is going to be demanding 60 or 70 dollars an hour minimum. So how can you compete with that? Again, one tenth, one tenth the price. How can you compete with that? So pay close attention to deflation. Prices of services are going to continue to go down. Continue. We've, I gave you the example of the websites. There are countless examples when it comes to technology, information services, IT, countless, countless examples. Your thoughts on this, Adam? I I agree. I mean, it's a uh, it's a great time and a scary time at the same at the same moment. I mean, you gotta you're gonna have to figure it out, and you're gonna have to realize you're gonna have to figure out how you can provide the value to to justify what you want, and you know, and just know that you know you may not get what you want because your talent suddenly isn't worth that. And deflation is not just a reduction in salary or wages or pricing prices deflation can mean the complete wipeout of of a product or, of, or a service. So, for example, right, with e-commerce, you brought up these e-commerce e shopping carts. You can hire someone, you can create a store, right, uh, selling stuff on the corner of your street and hire someone at $10 an hour to handle the store. So you created a job and you're selling product or you can digitize it and put everything online and have a shipment a center shipping the, the goods as they're ordered. And on top of that, now you don't need that cashier or that, or that employee who you hired. You can just pay you know, $20 a month to Stripe or some other e-commerce platform to, do, to, to collect all the credit cards and to take care of your store online. It's completely automated and digitized. So now you've just gotten rid of the overhead of the, the rent that you're paying on, on that corner store, the property taxes, the payroll tax, uh, because you've gotten rid of the employee, so you've gotten rid of the employee. That's deflation at work too, the complete wipeout of, of a business model or yeah, the business, not a business, but a business model or the structure of a business, that's deflation where it's gone to zero. It's not just re a reduction in pay because of competition. Now the competition is technology. It's a robot. It's the internet. It's a computer that's caused this wipeout. All right, homies. Well, it's been another great episode of the Work From Home Show. Visit us at workfromhomeshow.com. Check out all of our previous episodes there. Get on our mailing list. If you have any questions, hello at workfromhomeshow.com. Hello at workfromhomeshow.com. And until next time, keep on working from home.